Today on Real Talk with Zeb, we have Miss Paulette Lephart traveling all the way on the Thousand Mile Journey from Biloxi, Mississippi. How are you today? I am great, thank you. We're going to take it back a little bit. Um, in 2014, you were diagnosed with aggressive form of breast cancer. Correct. Was that the same year that you had the double vasectomy? Yes, was I was diagnosed in January 2014. Um, and I had the double mastectomy without reconstruction in February 2014. Now, what was the inspiration behind the Thousand Mile Journey to D.C.? God. <laughs> God was the one that woke me at 2 o'clock in the morning and prompted me, well, he told me I had breast cancer and prompted me to go and seek medical attention. So I was 47 years old with a strong family history of breast cancer. My grandmother, my mother, my aunt, and my first cousin all was diagnosed with breast cancer and I lost my aunt and my cousin the same year. My aunt died in July of 2013 and my cousin died June 1st, 2013 to breast cancer. And it just never dawned on me. You know, I was one of the women that believed that it would it could never happen to me. But also my family never talked about it. You know, the women in my family, they kept it to themselves. You know, they didn't make a big deal. They didn't make a lot of noise, you know. And that's the wrong thing to do. You know, that was the wrong thing to do. And it, I just never paid attention. You know, I really didn't pay attention to what breast cancer is, you know. And it took God himself to come down and wake me up at 2 o'clock in the morning to tell me that cancer was growing in my in my breast. Now, can we talk about the inspiration as far as um, the story of going up to um, some film direct, uh, documentary people said, yes. you might want to tell my story. Yes. Explain that. Well, um, I wanted to document the walk, you know, for many reasons. The number one reason is that there wasn't a lot on women who have had double mastectomies without reconstruction. And when I was going through the surgery and I found out that I wasn't a candidate because of other health issues, you know, and it would put my life in danger to do the double mastectomy, I mean the reconstruction, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to know what it looked like. I wanted to know what does a woman look like with no breasts? You know, I got on the internet, I searched and I searched and I searched and I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. I didn't, I, I couldn't find it. So after my double uh, mastectomy without reconstruction, I went into a deep depression, you know. I mean, you know, women as a, a young girl, I was raised to believe that breasts made us women. You know, it was a part of our identity as a woman. It was our femininity. You know, I can remember being a little girl and stuffing my shirt with socks and tissue to make, you know, to make myself feel like I was a woman, you know, as a little girl. And it was the breast that made me feel like a woman as a little girl. So we was raised to believe that our breast was our womanhood. So when mine was amputated, I was devastated. I was more devastated about losing my breast than I was about being diagnosed with breast cancer, you know. Um, and after I went through eight months of depression, um, I took a break from treatments, doctors, you know, hospitals, and I took my daughters, I have four young daughters, and we drove to Mississippi, my hometown, on a little vacation for the weekend on the beach. And it was on the beach that God came to me. You know, and he said, take off your shirt and take pictures, the Holy Spirit. And the beach was loaded with people. I mean, people was everywhere. And I'm looking around, but I know God's voice, you know. And again, it was the same voice that told me I had cancer. So I didn't want to disobey. So the Holy Spirit gave me the strength to stand there boldly and take off my top and do as I was instructed. I gave my daughter the camera and I told her to take pictures of my chest, you know, and as I was doing that, 
a lady yelled, you know, oh my God, she took off her shirt. And people started to gather. And I saw a couple ladies in the crowd crying. And I started to cry. And then after that, the whole beach just exploded into applause. And they was clapping for me. And that was a moment of freedom, not just for me, but everybody that was standing on the beach that day that saw my scars, it freed them. And after we left, I went back to the hotel and my 12 year old said, mom, put your, put your pictures on Facebook, you know? And I was like, I'm not putting those pictures on Facebook. You know, it was, I wasn't ready for that. And she said to me, she said, mom, do you know how many lives you can save? And then my mind went back to the day that I was looking for pictures and I couldn't find it of a woman with no breasts. So I told my daughter, you're right. So we uploaded it and the pictures went viral in 30 minutes. I mean, hundreds of thousands of likes and comments. And um, that's when I knew what God meant when he said he wanted to use my chest. And he gave me the vision to take my shirt off and walk a thousand miles bearing my scars. And it was again, you know, this journey has been amazing. You know, people would come up to me. No one said anything mean. You know, they, they, they were shocked. You know, you know, they was trying not to look, but they couldn't help but look. And, and most of them was brave enough to come up to me and have a conversation. And out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the people that I met on the road, they all told me the same thing about seeing a woman walking across the country being brave enough to bear her scars, you know, it made them realize that their circumstances wasn't as big as they thought they were. And it freed them from whatever they were going through. I had one lady stop me and say she was going home contemplating suicide. And when she saw me walking, she said she stopped her car. And of course she ran to me and she hugged me and she was like, oh my God, you know, I asked God to show me, show me something, you know, because she thought her life was just chaotic and bad and it wasn't worth living. And when she saw me, she said that gave her hope again, not in herself, but in God. So it, it was a, it was God's, God told me my, my pain had purpose. And, and another question I had was, as you know, pink is the symbolism for the breast cancer. Right. Explain the yellow. Well, pink represents awareness. You know, they use the ribbons, they use the pink to bring awareness. You know, we have enough, we have enough awareness. You know, we've been getting awareness for years, you know. Everybody's doing these walks, wearing their pink, and you know, bring, let, we're bringing breast cancer awareness. Time out for it. It's time for a cure. And yellow represents healing, you know. And, I'm, and I walked, and I'm here to petition Congress and fight for a cure. It's time for a cure. It's time for a change in our healthcare system. You know, people are dying in this country, not because of, of the cancer, you know, the, you know, being able to finance the medications and the doctor's appointments and the tests, it takes more from us than, than the cancer does. You know, and we need a better health care system. We need affordable health care. We need affordable treatments. We need affordable medications because we are dying because of lack of resources. You know, and if you don't have the money to pay, they're not going to treat you unless there is a life-threatening illness where you got to have surgery, you're bleeding to death. They have to perform some kind of procedure to save your life. If it's not a 911, having cancer is not a 911. You know, it's not, let's do surgery and save your life right away. If you don't have the money, they're not gonna treat you. I've been turned away because I didn't have my $150, you know, to go in and see my doctor and get my treatment. You know, we're dying because we don't have the, the resources to pay for this. And, I, and, and I'm walking topless to take the shame off of us, the women, 
in the, the men and, and the children that are fighting for their lives, and I'm putting our scars on the steps of Congress. Shame on this country to allow children, mothers, and fathers in this country to die trying to afford these pharmaceuticals high prices. It's, it's, it's time for a change, and you know, God has opened up the door for Congress. They open up their doors. They want to hear me. You know, not just me, but I need everybody to rally. You know, like now, I've been, thousands of people have been following me on my Facebook page, you know. This, these steps should be full, filled. There should be people all over this place because God has opened up the door, but it takes more than just my voice. I need everybody to rally. You know, people complain about the prices, but nobody's willing to stand up and fight. And in order for things to change, we gotta fight for it. It's unfortunate, but Dr. Martin Luther King didn't didn't um, give us the right to ride on the bus or sit on the bus where we want to just because he was complaining. He had to put action behind that. You know, and we need we need to fight. It's time out. I mean. All the other countries in this, in this world take care of their people when it comes to health care. Health care shouldn't be a luxury. Health care shouldn't be um, just for the rich. You know, we all, everybody should have a right to life-saving treatments when they're facing life-threatening diseases. And that's what I'm here to fight for. Last two questions. Yes. First question. On your thousand mile journey here to the District of Columbia, what was the hardest thing you had to face in and how did God help you through that moment? Well, I was being attacked uh, via Facebook, you know. Really? Yes, believe it or not, from three or four women, you know, who were saying things like, you know, I was faking cancer. I, I cut my breasts off, you know, um, as an elective, you know, I really didn't have breast cancer. You know, and they was discouraging other people. They would jump on, you know, they call them trolls. They would jump on the news stories, you know, to try to discourage the people that was getting hope from the story. You know, it hurt me, not for me, but for the people that they was discouraging. You know, but God kept telling me it's not my business. It's not my business, so I left it alone. You know, that was the hardest part you know, reading the, the, the vicious and the nastiness on the news reports from just four women, you know. And I know I had thousands of people support, in, in fact, millions, you know, were positive, and they were just four people. But it, it, it takes one bad, you know, it takes one bad apple sometimes. And that was the hardest part about the wall, is seeing other people being discouraged by the lies of these um, four women. Yeah. And the last question. Yes. Is there any fear that you have because of what you went through and other family members that it can affect your kids? Oh yeah, that's why I'm out here. You know, I don't want to see, not just my kids, I don't want to see anybody go through this and don't have the resources to, to, to get the treatments that they need. I don't want to see now nobody, no human being should go through that. No human being should choose between paying for a, a, a roof over their kids' heads and food and saving their lives. That shouldn't be a choice, not in America, nowhere, but especially not in America. I really appreciate, appreciate your time today and happy birthday. Thank today you. is your 50th, 50th. 50th birthday. Yes. Thank you. 50th. I got, I got some good supporters out here. Thank you for your time again. Thank you. All right. God, God bless. bless you. Bye.